Hey, Marianne. <laughs> You're looking very orange today. Yeah, I'm setting up my camera. <laughs> uh, so I think you should be able to share your screen if you want to test that. Oh, I meant to do that. I meant to test that. Yep. You can see it. Uh, yeah. Yep. Looks good. Okay. Cool. Um, stop share. At least until you're you're done. And I'm already recording, so oh. I'm gonna, I think uh, you're Hello, future that. self. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> so beware of that we're recording, and go distribute this later. Um, yeah, I um, I know at least one person said that they wanted to see it. So cool. Yeah, we'll, we'll have it, it. Works for me. <laughs> yeah, we definitely have more documentation of all our research and scholarly activities nowadays with zoom yeah it's kind of cool to be able to put a link in my cv and be like oh you can see this conference panel that i gave or whatever yeah, yeah it's great yeah that's what i've been doing too yeah. speaking of which this is is this a big year for you dossier was oh yeah I, I just finished it yesterday i submit for Ooh. the tenure yeah congratulations thanks <laughs> Oops. Yeah, my my camera is. <laughs> it's okay. It is my phone, actually. So, but it's well, really good sound quality for for your phone. Oh no, I'm on the computer, but my I turned my phone into the camera, which it's now not doing. Because so, I don't really have a. Gotcha. Yeah, my my mom's computer doesn't have a a webcam, so. Yeah, apparently everybody is discovering that their Monmouth computers did not come with web webcams, so. <laughs> yeah. Did I hear we are recording today's session? Yes. Jeff, I can't recall if we've talked about a works in progress playlist for our department YouTube channel. Um, we have, well, no, we haven't, but I mean, I have them up on YouTube, some of them at least. You too okay so are they on like your personal page or uh they are yeah they're they are right. uh i um, believe they're posted to like yeah my <laughs> some some gmail account that i have yeah i'll come next door and bother you more about this later okay sounds good well this part is being recorded melissa so we have <laughs> this now for future reference too yeah we can chop this off the recording. This is fine. <laughs> yeah. I think everybody's having I'll difficulties. I'll mute now and be quiet. <laughs> we got. <laughs> okay. Um, Aha, there he is. <laughs> oh, wow. Adam's here. Okay. I got to see if I can find. Mm-hmm. 
so we're at 115, but um, we had like 15 or so RSVPs, so maybe just a, a minute or two for folks to join. That's totally fine. I am looking to see if I can find one of the examples. I've got so many examples. <laughs> like, cool. you're going to have to, like, get the hook out to shut me up. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh, we'll let others join if, if they will be, and uh, we'll get started. Uh, hi, everybody. So uh, today is our um, first works in progress talk of this academic year. Uh, we do this uh, monthly. Um, and our first one of this year is uh, Marianne Rett, and she's here to talk to us about comics and how they can be used in the classroom. Um, and so I'll, I'll let Marianne take it from here because we have a lot to learn. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. Um, as I was just saying to Jeff before um, everybody showed up, you guys might have to get the hook out and like make me shut up. Um, I am so excited to talk about this. Um, a few folks around the department have already heard me spiel on about um, some of the stuff I'm going to talk about today. And I've had so many of you in my mind as I've gone through this collection and been like, oh, I need to remember and show this one to Katie or this one to Matt or whatever. So I'm going to try and um, show you guys um, some of the examples that um, I've found that, that in particular, I, I think pertain to your own interests as well. So um, to get started, let me share my screen. Um, so broadly speaking, what I'm talking about, what all of this is, is a, a sort of sub-series of comics, which um, we're going to call history comics. Um, and really quickly, um, just I'm going to go over a couple of sort of quick intro things. Um, when I say comics, I really mean what we would more broadly call sequential art. So I actually argue that, you know, the first sort of wave of, of these history comics, you know, goes all the way back to the ancient world. Um, I was on a panel recently with a colleague at San Diego State who um, spent her entire time talking about um, uh, the ancient Romans and, and how we can use like Trajan's column, for example, in the same way that we use comics um, and comic books like floppies that we think of today. So in this sort of subset of comics, um, we can go back to the ancient world up to about the 1780s and we start to see um, some shifts happening in comics globally um, and, and a printed comic. Um, you know, on a printed page starts to emerge, give or take around then. Then that second wave where I'm going to spend an awful lot of my talk today um, sort of emerges about then, um, you know, late 1700s. And then it's going to not disappear, but it's kind of going to ebb away in the 1940s 
particularly when we see the rise of what we would call sort of colloquially um, the floppy. Um, if you're thinking of a superhero comic book, um, you know, Superman or, or Spider-Man or something like that, that's the floppy, right? The, the thing that you can buy on those like magazine racks and stuff like that. They emerge, they really actually emerge in the 1930s, but of course they're, they're really propelled by World War II. Um, and so that's why there's this sort of gray area in the 1930s, 40s. And then we're in sort of a fourth wave or phase. I'm definitely all ears for new language. Um, you know, I, talking about first and second waves, of course, brings to mind feminist history, and that might not be useful. Um, anyway, so we're in a present uh, wave right now. Um, if you're familiar with works like Mouse, um, Persepolis, I just got in the mail yesterday. Um, they called us enemy which I just have to share this, signed by the man himself, George Takai. The, that panel that I was on was actually for Rose City Comic Con. Um, I couldn't be in Portland, in Portland, Oregon for it, um, but my friends were there. And um, one, of my, one of my colleague friends um, was able to get tickets to see George Takai and, and therefore get him to sign several copies of his work. And it, if you have not read it, if you have not picked it up yet, come see me. I will loan this priceless <laughs> signed copy to you, but it is brilliant. It's really, really well done. So, um, so that's sort of where we are in the present day. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on in history comics right now. And a lot of scholars of comics will say, oh, this is, you know, this is really the heyday of comics. Well, I'm going to argue that it's, it's actually, um, particularly in educational settings, that it, it's actually much earlier than today. So just to kind of give you some examples, when I talk about these waves, right? Um, yeah, so the Bayou Tapestry is another example of sort of these pre, pre-modern, if you will, um, comics. Um, another one that I like to um, use when I teach this in my classes, there are these scrolls um, that have been done over various uh, centuries, there are different versions um, from in Japan that talk about the Mongol um, invasion of Japan. Um, and so you can read those in much the same way you would read a, a comic book. Um, uh, the Mexican codices, um, some of them deal specifically with history. So, you know, they're telling a narrative largely pictorial, although there's um, some written language as well in some of them. Um, and so you get, and that's that's sort of the important feature, right? That you're getting a sequence of visuals, sometimes with words, sometimes not. Um, and we see that in this sort of first wave. I'm gonna skip the second wave because like I said, I'm gonna come back to it. So we're gonna jump ahead. So sort of the 1940s, we start to see the comic book emerge and history is right there. We are actually seeing some reprints of earlier um, comics that are gonna be reprinted into the floppies and I'll talk a little bit about that. But we start to see people um, really taking history and putting it in comic book form. Um, I Again, I've got some of these um, examples. So if you're ever interested, feel free to, to come and talk to me. Um, and then of course the present, like I said, one of my favorites is Will Eisner. I mean, Will Eisner is sort of the, the father of the graphic novel, um, but one of my favorite history comic books is the plot, the secret uh, story of the protocols of the elders of Zion. Um, if you ever want to teach about the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, I highly, highly recommend this. It's super accessible. It's um, very easy to understand and um, it brings it right down to the present. Um, uh, Professor Britsky and I have actually talked in a podcast about the Showa series, which is a massive set of manga style um, graphic novel histories of um, Showa Japan. Um, this is just one cover for the series. Um, and then I've also um, 
been lucky enough to read some African um, history graphic novels that are coming out. Um, there's a lot of really good comic work being done in Africa, in Sub-Saharan Africa in particular right now. So, you know, the, the story of Shaka in particular um, is one of these really important stories that we're seeing. So returning to my second wave or second phase or whatever the hell I'm calling it. Um, really it kind of starts to begin in the early 1800s um, and we see it in various places all over the world. Um, much of what I'm talking about today is really going to be US centric um, or at least Anglophone centric mostly because I'm a monoglot. Um, you know I'm trying but I also have some examples from Spain um, and in Spain, there's a there's a, a style of broadsheet that is called Auca. They're Catalan specific. That's where they um, emerged from. And you're getting a close up here of one example. There are forty, usually forty eight um, panels on a broadsheet. Um, you could buy the broadsheet, you know, from a printer, or sometimes they were posted um, around town. A large, large number of these are saints' lives. Um, some of them are fictional stories. Some of them are sort of pure entertainment. You know, maybe talking about a a ball game or a famous um, um, bullfighter or something like that. But there are a significant number that are histories. Um, Christopher Columbus gets, not surprisingly, a pretty big look in. Um, there are several copies about Christopher Columbus. Napoleon, um, both Napoleon Bonaparte and Napoleon III um, get several of their own um, broadsheets. Um, I thought this one was interesting. This is a history of the Spanish-Moroccan War from about the middle of the 19th century. At the time of its publication, this would have been more like um, current events. Um, but of course, you know, for an American audience in particular, who's probably never even heard about the Spanish-Moroccan War, um, you know, this would be an interesting thing to, to sort of grapple with, you know, different um, ways in which we understand national histories and wars and that sort of thing. Um, and actually the first ALCA that I came across was this one. It's a history of Giuseppe Garibaldi, who was an Italian nationalist, but um, sort of globally an important nationalist. And so I thought that was really interesting that, that he got his own um, example. So as I say, these are all in Spanish or Catalan, depending on where they were published. Um, I am slowly working my way through them and using Google Translate to translate them. They're usually, um, obviously there's these 48 panels and then below each panel is a rhyming couplet or triplet. Um, it's pretty tricky because it's not, you know, an actual sort of narrative with this happened and then this happened, it's usually, heavily um, uh, overlaid with um, sort of metaphor and inside jokes that like locals would have known, but you have to really um, dig into the history first of Catalan and then more largely the history that's being um, taught. But it's interesting to me because it, it's a very um, Spanish specific style but we see it influence particularly French style comics. Um, French style comics also influence it. So there is a dialogue going on as well. Um, particularly by the 1930s, these really come back into the fore in the 1930s and are used very widely for propaganda um, in the midst of the um, Spanish Civil War. The comics the, a large percentage of the comics I'm going to really focus on today, in particular highlights of history, um, are comics that were, ran in newspapers across the United States. Um, I've got some examples from Great Britain and from Canada as well, and I'll talk a little more about that. But highlights of history in particular is important because from the moment it began, it was being touted as something that could be used 
um, in the classroom. So you see here um, on the left, this, this full page spread advertisement, giving you some examples of what to expect um, in coming weeks when these get published and a note to in this case vermont teachers this is what you could do this is how you could use these in your classroom have your students cut these out of the newspaper and bring them into class and then you can supplement your curriculum with this um with the with these comics um it they i have found evidence obviously here from the high school the high school journal, so an academic journal about high school education from 1929. They're talking specifically about highlights of history. I found theses and dissertations of ed majors um, talking about specifically using highlights of history or just using comics more generally in the 1920s and the 1930s. So while a lot of comic scholars are like, oh, we're doing something really exciting and new, not really. Um, there's a pretty deep history of using comics and comic strips in particular um, in the classroom. And there is a comment. Um, so anyway, um, so that's the, um, advertising stuff let me there we go so give you some examples and this is essentially kind of where we're going to dive you know for the rest of this is sort of just kind of give you some examples and talk about what i've found this is just an example um of a large percentage of the ones i have come from the evening star which was a washington dc is a washington dc newspaper um and runs mo uh, particularly highlights of history is running from like 1924 to 1942. Um, so this is a page this is actually from like the automobiles um, you know so it's like the the one ads um, section of the newspaper and you see comics kind of tucked into very strange places before we start to get comic pages and funny pages. Um, so here's just an example here we have four comics running on this page. You have the Swiss Family Robinson, um, an example from Highlights of History, Outline of Science, and um, Here's to Your Health. And I'm gonna focus more on the, the sort of history educational ones. Swiss Family Robinson, of course, is interesting, um, but it, it wasn't necessarily meant to be teaching something. Um, the Highlights of History one at the very top is part of a fairly substantial subseries on the Civil War, which I have shared already with um, Chris, but I'm, I'm happy to share with anybody else who'd like to see that. Um, and we can talk about that in more detail later. Um, here to your health is an interesting little um, sort of side note. It's, you know, little sort of ideas about, you know, how to properly feed your baby, how to take care of a cold, um, how to properly prepare certain foods. You know, it's sort of a, a how to um, survive, uh, um, but in a very basic sort of way um, from the 1920s. It wasn't, it doesn't seem to have been very long um, lasting, but it, it's sort of interesting to see in there. There's one actually, one um, strip that's really about um, the mental health of your, of your like teenager and how to protect the mental health of your teenager and how to not push them um, to sort of a breaking point, how to not like kill their interests by demanding um, perfection and things, which is sort of interesting. Anyway, the one I wanna highlight though is this outline of science. This was another series that ran um, again in the 1920s and 30s, um, sort of, they're not all historical, um, sometimes they are, sometimes they aren't, sometimes they're more, you know, sort of basic um, science, you know, how, how do we know what the moon is made of sort of stuff, right? So sometimes it's, it's much more basic science, sometimes it's mixed with historical. This one, Climate Aids Progress, is one I found particularly interesting because it's an amazingly good example of racialized thinking and climatic or um, geographic determinism. Um, 
um, in the 1920s and 30s and, and before it was not unheard of for um, race theorists to you know talk about you know why northern europeans um had had sort of been so successful in civilizational matters well it was because of the moderate climate that they lived in and those that come from hotter climates are just naturally not as adept at progress so this you know sort of reinforcing the idea of um, european and neo-european ex exceptionalism um, and so you see this here right climate um, has influenced man's climb towards civilization and the great advances in science um, and innovation in ancient times were made by a few nations in regions where the climate varies from season to season and you know we we still see a lot of that in what we talk about in say history 101 right and about the floods and the regularity of floods of rivers like the nile being really important for um, helping society settle um, although the Eskimos, yes, an inappropriate term, are um, ingenious, the frozen north has never made any outstanding gift to progress. So that there's this idea that you can be too hot or too cold. Um, in, the in the last one, extreme hot weather kills energy. So that you have to have this sort of moderate climate in order to progress civilizationally. What's so interesting to me about all of these com comics is that we all know this, right? There's no national curriculum, um, certainly not in the 1920s and 30s, but these comics, Outline of Science, Highlights of History, all of these are running nationally, in some cases internationally, and they are de facto creating um, a national curriculum particularly highlights of history, sort of saying, this is what it means to be American. This is what it means to be Canadian, you know, whatever the example might be. Um, another sub-series that I um, found is called Famous Love Romances. I will be the first to admit that I rolled my eyes pretty hard when I first came across it. I was like, oh, that's supposed to be the girl's comic, right? Um, but the more I read them, the more I was like, oh, actually, this is really interesting because it gives us sort of a historical insight, um, not only into these famous male characters in history, but also to the women in their lives or sometimes more deeply into famous um, female characters. Um, there's a whole series on Percy Shelley and Mary, uh, Mary Godwin, who becomes Mary Shelley. Um, it's interesting, um, you know, because we get, you know, both Mary and Percy's side of the story. We get, you know, some sense of, of self um, from both characters. What's really frustrating about it is there's not a single word about Frankenstein in there at all. And I'm just like, how did that happen? Um, so it's not perfect, um, but it's it's interesting to start to see women appearing in these um, stories. I want to use the next two examples to, to sort of juxtapose, right? We have one example is a series about Dante and Beatrice. This is Dante of Dante's Inferno. Um, and then the other example is Andrew Jackson and Rachel Robards. I, I will admit, I know almost nothing about Dante, um, but after reading the series about Dante and Beatrice, I really don't like the dude. Um, he, he's, he, he's creepy and um, like we'd call him a stalker today, um, you know, and Beatrice, even though she her name's in the title, she has no voice whatsoever. It is all from Dante's point of view. It is all his longing and wishing to be with her. And she's like living her life, you know, she goes off and does her thing. And he's just like sort of pining after her and, and he's sort of grasping after her and just like, how is this romantic, you know? Um, which we can ask, you know, our students, how has romance changed? You know, what do we consider romantic anymore? I mean, to me, like I say, Dante's creepy as hell. But I would never be uh, quick to give 
Andrew Jackson props for anything. However, um, in the story of Andrew Jackson and Rachel Rovars, I I actually found myself like, oh, well, maybe he wasn't all bad, <laughs> you know, like um, because in this story, you know, they're both equals. They're treated as equals, um, you know. We get all of the sort of bombasticness of of Jackson and how Rachel is able to sort of keep him, you know, kind of controlled and kind of calm-ish. Um, we she has agency of her own. She, you know, as we're told in the story, you know, she finds religion and all of this other stuff. So it's it's interesting that even in this series, depending on the narrative we get the women do have agency or they don't have agency kind of depending on who's being part of it. Um, a quick side note, there are two in this series that are just titled for the women. So there's Mary Queen of Scots um, and Cleopatra. And not none of their, their loves get put in the title. And maybe it's because they had more than one love, but um, it's sort of interesting to see how they're put up um, away. All right, so a little bit of statistics, I guess. Um, these are some of the titles that I've been playing with. Um, Highlights of History and Boys and Girls the World Over um, are series that were done by this man, um, J. Carroll Mansfield. Um, in the U.S., they ran in the U.S. Highlights of history I have found in Australian publications, Canadian publications, um, and New Zealand as well. So they were definitely um, being syndicated all over the world. They were absolutely syndicated all over the United States. I have found them pretty much everywhere you can imagine. Um, just because I grew up in Colorado, um, I knew about Colorful Colorado, which is less sequential, but definitely got a lot of um, sort of tidbits of history buried in it. So I kind of threw that in there. Famous love romances I've already talked about, Outline of Science as well. Um, Book of Knowledge, I have not um, built on this one that much. It, it, it's... It's very clear that a lot of these started as a result of how successful Mansfield was. And I think that's where Book of Knowledge comes into it. It's, it's trying to do this, um, what Mansfield's doing, but it's not doing as good a job. It's really pulling from, you know, an encyclopedia in this case. Texas history movies. Um, I have not started in on this. There's actually a lot written on Texas history movies. Um, they were first published in the 1920s, um, and then after they ran in the newspaper, they were pulled together and published again as a book, and they were, they were given free to schools throughout Texas and became part of the curriculum for about 30 years, 30 or 40 years um, after this, and I need to talk to um, Heidi's mom to see if she has any memory of using or reading these um, comics because they were they were pretty pervasive and so like I say there's a lot already done on them but they need to be mentioned in here. Humors of history more humors of history are British um, and they're very British in their take on things. Mansfield's pretty serious in in how he depicts history um, you know it's sort of I don't want to say it's the facts of history, but there's not a lot of word bubbles. Um, he's not doing anything anachronistic. Moreland, um, the British creator, is very much doing anachronistic stuff. Um, as I'm reading, you know, these different types, I'm I'm realizing that the British perception of history is probably a bit more irreverent because they've got so much more history. <laughs> You know, they've been around for a while. The American um, production of history is, you know, they, they sort of have to prove themselves. We see that too with this Canada Hours, which is very much in the same vein as highlights of history. Um, but from a Canadian point of view, it takes it pretty seriously. Moreland is pretty irreverent. Um, if you're going to see slurs, used racial slurs used you'll see them nine times out of ten in the british ones um, in a play where you're less likely to see them in the american and canadian ones but moreland was used throughout the british empire we see him in newspapers pretty much anywhere the british went um 
humors and more humors are being published. Uh, okay, so um, Boys and Girls the World Over is usually a one panel um, comic. And it has, it, it's very sort of like a comic meets the world almanac. You know, he's got a little picture depicting a girl and a little picture depicting a boy in national dress of the area. And um, then something about, you know, the production in that place or, you know, the religion of the people or something like that. It's interesting, um, you know, now that I've gone through and I think found them all, you know, how much coverage places get. Not surprisingly, Europe gets a lot of coverage um, and, you know, Oceania doesn't get as much. Um, but it is interesting how much, say, Sub-Saharan Africa gets. Um, there's some interesting things to note. India does not have its own. Um, and this, of course, would have been India and Pakistan because um, this is pre, um, pre partition. Um, only Cuba is mentioned of all the Caribbean nations. Cuba is the only one that gets mentioned, which probably is a statement about the, the relationship between the United States and Cuba. I find it um, interesting Puerto Rico doesn't get mentioned, but that might be because by then, of course, it's a territory, right, of the United States. Um, and so it's just sort of subsumed. Um, for North America, we only get Mexico, Greenland, and Labrador, which is sort of interesting in and of itself. Um, not Canada, and obviously not the US, because the US gets plenty of coverage. Um, I find Europe particularly interesting because Germany is not in there. Um, neither is the UK, although the Irish Free State does get listed. Um, so um, probably for the UK, it's probably because British history is so embedded in American history. Um, but the lack of Germany, France is there, Holland is there, but no Germany, I found very surprising until I started thinking about the dates of publication. These ran from 1934 to 1936. So we've got Hitler in power at this point. Austria gets a look in, but that's because it's before Anschluss. So I think the lack of Germany um, was probably being done um, specifically in relationship to what is going on with Hitler um, and, and the rise of Nazism at the time. Again, that's a guess. One of the things I'm also doing, and I'm going to show you guys my database that I'm working with in a few minutes, is sort of trying to keep track of who's in these comics. Is it all just white dudes? Um, and so, you know, how many times do we see women being depicted? Um, are they referenced, you know, like just the concept of women um, as a reference point? Are they actually named? Do they, they have a voice of their own? You know, we see a lot of women depicted. You know, they might be background, you know, women sending soldiers off to war or something like that. Um, but comparatively speaking, not as many being named, right? Um, 91 so far, give or take, that I've cataloged being actually named. But it's not always, as I've already sort of hinted at, it's not always cameo history, right? The women that make an appearance um, are usually part of the story um, and not just being dropped into it. I find it interesting when he does um, ancient Egypt, when it, you know, he covers ancient Egypt, he covers Cleopatra and Hatshepsut. But he doesn't talk about Ramses. He doesn't talk about Tutankhamun. He doesn't talk about any of the, the male leaders. It's um, always, um, and I say he, I'm sorry, I'm talking about Mansfield here. Um, this is probably really small, so bear with me for just a second, but I'm attempting to try and keep track of sort of thematically what's getting covered. Um, not surprisingly, the, the US Civil War and World War I get a great deal of coverage. I have not actually quantified all of the revolution yet, so there's probably a few more out there that, that are in there. Um, but it's interesting to me, and obviously military history is going to be much bigger than that because I didn't necessarily count all of World War One as military history and all of the Civil War as um, uh, 
military history. But it's interesting other stories like that um, the Boxer Rebellion gets a whole subseries of its own, the Mexican-American War, the Spanish-American War. Um, religious history actually gets quite a look in and not just Christian religious history. Um, there's actually quite a bit on um, Islamic history and on Jewish history as well. Um, then there's some other themes that I'm trying to, to keep an eye on. When do we see education discussed um, in different parts of the world? Um, colonialism gets a lot of discussion. Decolonization doesn't. Um, it's not really a thing yet. Um, so it's just sort of interesting. Um, and I'm adding more as I go. Um, you know, I start to see one or two and I'm like, oh, maybe I should make this a, another um, thematic point. So um, I am going to, let me see if I can do this. Are you guys seeing, did you guys see me switch? Thank you. Okay. So this is um, my database. It's not really a good database, but it, it works for me. Um, I, I have so far I've entered something like 3000 um, titles from various um, series. As I've already said, you know, I'm keeping all the bibliographic information and the thematic information, the eras. Um, you know, I've got a lot of friends who work in the ancient world and there's surprisingly little comic work done on the ancient world. So I'm keeping track of that to give to them. Um, and I've been sharing with them. Keep trying to keep track of key names. Um, and I'm playing with keywords, although I'm not terribly good at that yet either. For my own edification, I'm keeping track of whether they're, um, you know, a traditional sort of comic strip that you would get in a newspaper. Are they a full page comic strip? What, what do they look like? Um, and then parts of the world. Some of the other information that I'm keeping are, do we see problematic words um, or images being used? For example, um, do we see like really grotesque stereotypes, racial stereotypes in how say a black person is um, depicted or how a Jewish person is depicted? Um, do we see the use of red skin? for example, very common. Uh, red skin and red man are exceedingly common in Mansfield's work. Um, I am happy to say the really bad N word has not appeared in any of the works, um, but I've definitely come across Jewish and Spanish racial slurs. Um, uh, other terms like coolie, um cannibal because cannibal is often tied to sort of or savage are tied to these sort of racial designations so i'm keeping track of that sort of thing um again i've already talked about the depiction of women i'm also um trying to keep track of and i don't like this phrasing i don't like this structure yet so i'm really looking forward to hearing what you guys might have to say but about non-white um male characters you know who who's not from the dominant white um, colonial culture. Are they, how are they, are they depicted? And if they're depicted or if they're not depicted, are they named? Um, and that's actually pretty surprising. There's actually quite a large number of non-white males who are named um, and who even have their own subseries. So that's the kind of stuff I'm keeping um, data on. All right. So I do want, I want like, I want you guys to ask questions, uh, <laughs> but I'm going to, where do we go? I'm gonna give you some examples real fast. Um, just a few more examples, just to kind of give you um, some idea of what I'm talking about. I told you that Islam gets covered. Um, there's a couple, there's two full page spreads on the history of Islam. Um, we have Muhammad being depicted in this history, um, of course, this is, you know, the 1920s. Um, this wasn't the first time Muhammad's depicted in a comic, nor will it be the last time. Um, what I find really interesting about this is that, um, oh, sorry, that Khadija, his first wife, is depicted. Um, and not only is she depicted, but we actually see her, um, sorry, discussed as the first um, 
convert to Islam, which is a point that I'm, I am always trying to make with my students that even before Muhammad accepts what has happened to him, she's like, yeah, this, this is, this is something great. This is something wonderful. This is something powerful. And she's accepting it even before he does. Um, so I find it interesting to see Khadija get sort of centered in the story like that. Uh, um, there's um, a lot of stuff about what, you know, what Islam means. I mean, he still refers to Muslims nine times out of 10 as Mohammedans. Um, but there is sort of a conscious effort to try and move towards um, Muslim. Here's an example of that boys and girls the world over. Many of Mansfield's um, comics were actually republished in Famous Funnies when the floppies started to emerge. So there are, there are actually extant <laughs> color versions of them, which is kind of exciting. Um, most of the databases I'm using are all black and white. So even if they were a Sunday supplement, I'm still not getting them in color, which is sad. Um, it just means I have to go to the archive and take pictures myself. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, so here's one from Afghanistan talking about um, you know, what Afghanistan, oops, what Afghanistan looked like, um, giving you a sense of what a little Afghan girl and a little Afghan boy would, um, would dress like. And you think about this, this is really informing the readership of what the world around them looks like. Um, personally, of course, this one was really exciting when I came across it. So this is Palestine. Um, so we have uh, a discussion of what Palestine is. This is in the interwar period. So Palestine is still under the British mandate, it's still being controlled by um, the British, as you see down here. But they're in a national ho homeland for the Jews. So the Balfour Declaration gets a look in. Um, and we also see up here Zionists being mentioned, that the Zionists are planting Jewish settlements in Judea and Samara and upper and lower Galilee, modern improvements such as good road sanitation, scientific farming, water power projects are replacing primitive methods. So there's there's clearly a civilizational um, dialogue uh, being established, particularly in this example, but we see it in, in many of the others as well. Um, ooh, that's a lot blurrier than I expected it to be. Sorry about that. So um, it's not just US history, as I've already mentioned, um, the Boxer Rebellion and all of that, the Sepoy Rebellion, Rebellion, what we would call um, the Sepoy mutiny, what some people call the Sepoy mutiny, um, but the the uprising in the middle of the 19th century in India, which ultimately leads to Queen Victoria becoming Empress of India, um, gets coverage. This is pretty impressive, um, you know, that they're being introduced to these events and these places and these names. Here's another example from those Alka that I was talking about. This one I was really excited about when I found it. This is a history of the Boer War, the war in the Transvaal. Um, so it's kind of exciting because it's from a Spanish point of view, um, which I, I mean, we barely get any history of the Boer War, I think, in this country. But to have it from a Spanish point of view is particularly interesting. Um, but what really, really, really jumped out at me, sorry, I'm going to be like that nerd for just a moment, is, I don't know if you can see this down here, this is um, panel 31, Let's see if I can, oops, no, no, go back, hold on, I'm going to see if I can zoom in on this a little bit. Um, anyway, that panel down there, if I can make it bigger, is... It's like a little rectangle with um, a circle and an image of a woman in there. It is an image of Queen Victoria um, and it is a chocolate bar. Did anybody see the news of last spring about the chocolate bar from the Boer War that came up for auction? Did, did anybody catch this? It was all over BBC News anyway. Um, so yeah, somebody in their like grandfather's stuff found an old tin with a bar of chocolate from the Boer War. Okay, that's interesting. Well, you know, a couple months later, I come across this. And this is the chocolate bar. This chocolate bar, this was a thing. This was a 
big deal at the time. Even Winston Churchill, who was serving in the, the war, had been writing home. And he's bitching about the fact that all we're getting is chocolate because Queen Victoria made it a big deal. She wanted to give the troops something for them to commemorate their experience because that's what you want to remember is the, the atrocities of the Boer War, right? So she had um, the chocolatiers of, of Britain um, make pound tins of chocolate to send off to the troops that were fighting in South Africa. Well, here's the catch. All the chocolatiers of Britain were Quakers, and they were not interested in supporting the war effort. So um, the, the leaders of the chocolate companies um, and Queen Victoria's folks got together and they, they hammered out a deal and ultimately the chocolate was produced um, and the money went, the proceeds went to, to charities. But it's just, it was, I was just like, why is this chocolate bar in a Spanish comic about the Boer War? Um, I am babbling so much now. Please, let's, let's, I, I could keep going. Like I said, I've got so many examples, but I want to, want to hear your questions. I want to hear your thoughts. If you have a specific um, comic that you, you know, or a theme or something you'd like to see if I've got um, access to, please, um, please ask, you know, um, I've got so much I could say about this stuff. <laughs> Marianne, um, the database is really immense and uh, it looks like you can go in so many cool directions with it. Um, a couple things that occurred to me during the talk um, that, I, that I thought I would comment on and I'll end with a question um, okay. is that uh, um, you note that even in the 1920s, there are outsiders, um, uh, people outside the history teaching profession who have great ideas about what can be inserted into that curriculum, a tradition that comes right down to Bill Gates and big history uh, um, yep. uh, today. Um, and I wanted to point out that in the 20s is the decade in which a majority of American kids are going to high school uh, at that point. So it really is at the beginning uh, there. And um, I wonder uh, if... Um, Anything like that kind of change, whether social, like majority going to high school or technological, um, uh, coincides with the naming of these waves uh, or, the, or, or the demarcations mm. between the waves. I'm particularly drawn to uh, the idea of this uh, Texas strip being called Texas Movies seems to mm. suggest that, that you had to have an actual motion picture before you could decide to to uh, make a, a series of sequential stills. Think to, to think of them in a certain way of 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 a, of a kind of kinetic uh, in a kind of kinetic way uh, that um, uh, made me wonder: uh, Is there a, a major printing moment or a mass distribution moment that that coincides with with one wave shifting to another? I mean, definitely when it comes to that shift between sort of this phase and the next phase, because of course that's when we get those, that pulp um, production of the comic book. And so, you know, the production changes, very cheap materials to be working with and all of that. Um, that term movies was actually pretty common being used in comics. And it was not drawing on movies like we think of like films it was drawing on the idea that the sequence of things is happening so you're moving across the panels um at least that's the the from what i've read um the creators at the time say on those those rare times they do use movies in the title that's what they were thinking is that it's history on the move or it's the story on the move um and I don't know that movies was actually, I, I don't know this for a fact, but I don't think it was in parlance in the same way, like in talking about film that we talk about, you know, like um, like talkies or something like that, right? That wasn't as, u as used um, at the time. So it's this moment where both of those media are, are kind of grappling with what to call themselves, right? So, but that's a good, that's a really good 
point though that there are these moments, things are changing in these moments um, to give those waves or phases titles. Thank you, Chris. Uh, Matt. Marianne, I think it's, it was a terrific talk. Um, I was really interested in what, at the beginning you talked about how the comics had this racialized talk and geographic mm -hmm. determinism about them. And then something you said later in your talk with the, um, I guess, with the, showing the two little children from the, the, the boy and the girl from each areas of the world. And then the, the, the strip about Muhammad um, mm -hmm. and said what the world around them looks like. It struck me that the, the images that you showed, they all looked European. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and, um, uh, there are actually yeah. two parts of the question. Yeah. That's one. And the other thing, uh, when talking about the Indian mutiny or the Sepoy rebellion, mm -hmm or any other event in history, do they re reinforce certain narratives? Uh, for, say, for instance, do they show the, the Sepoy Rebellion as, well, the, those, those nefarious Indians are rebelling against us to, uh, sort of deal? Yes and no. Um, so to, to take your second question first, um, you know, the the sepoy rebellion we're told is started because of the cartridges being you know waxed with um either pig fat or, or beef tallow you know or whatever um so there are definitely those myths that we st we still see keep being heard or or those ideas right reinforcing um yes it, not so much in the Sepoy Rebellion. That one is, while it's still racialized in many of the same ways, it's a little more, it's treated a little more fairly. Uh -huh. um, the Native American, the Indian Wars, um, you know, like the one about Geronimo, um, there's a lot, there's a lot going on mm -hmm. there, you know, about how the natives, you know, there were, there were the subservient natives, and there were the hostile natives and the, the good subservient natives had civilization and would settle down and farm and go to school and the hostile wouldn't accept white man's control. So yeah, there's, there's still that um, sort of narrative being uh, reinforced in some of these. Mm -hmm. um, yes, about the, the, the imagery and the depiction of, um, women of of people um there's a little bit of, of you see distinction of east asians um mm -hmm. in particular and africans or people of african descent They're, they are very clearly in most of these racialized um and then as i said earlier, um racialization in many comics as well um but for the most part, everyone else does look. And this is why I, I really want to see some of these in color, because I'd love to see what what colors they were using mm -hmm. um, to print some of these. But for the most part, they do. They look very European. And I think it, oftentimes that's because that's what the artist was familiar with um, and, you know, was just trying to get a face out you know, to um, present. Um, let me just quickly, I've got one of many of Cleopatra um, here. I think going back to Chris's point, there is definitely an influence from the movies, from film yeah. on how people are being depicted. And we see this, um, you know, we see this sort of heavy lidded um you know the the vamps of the 1920s making their way onto um yeah right so um you know it's it's pre charlton heston but the, you know the one with um i think it's esther the story of esther you're just like wow how is how is that not charlton heston but it's not <laughs> but clearly there is this you know this um dialogue uh, between Hollywood production of what people looked like and 
comic production of what people look like going on. So good, good questions. Yes. Thank you. Other questions? I can keep showing examples. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm impressed with your with your database, Marianne, as it's large. It, and it, it could be mapped too. like you have, you know, you have origins and you have also like places being discussed. So you could create some pretty cool maps with the, the spreadsheet that you have. I really want to talk to you about that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I, I because I would love to know, I would love to map where, you know, in an ideal world, I'd love to map where they were published. I'd love to map what they're covering, you know, um, the places um, that they're being covered. And yeah, I'd love, I'd love to make this more interactive. I think that's the, the big end goal is to have maps, to have a, a, a website that, you know, it, can go to at the moment I've got several friends across the country who are like oh send me you know titles for anything on sub-saharan African history okay here you go you know um but I'd love to have a website where somebody can type in sub-saharan Africa and you know those links to chronicling America or wherever will just come up and they can go to them themselves so yeah Jeff I I'm gonna talk to you <laughs> Sure. <laughs> That's good. So Marianne actually shared this uh, database uh, with me for my course on public memory of the U.S. Civil War, uh, how Americans have uh, conceptualized the Civil War uh, over the decades since. And um, uh, so we talked uh, about uh, the Mansfield uh, a series, the highlights, uh, portions of highlights that, that pertain to the Civil War, which you saw from the database page that Marianne showed is quite extensive. And um, I remember remarking to Marianne, this is at the beginning of the semester, uh, that, you know, we, there wasn't much uh, lost cause etiology in the um, in, in, in these strips that they were, you know, they were sort of a cut above the public discourse at the time. And um, so I Googled around on, uh, uh, on Mansfield himself. So uh, it turns out he was a Marylander and um, a World War I veteran. He wrote um, uh, or, or illustrated, I should say, wrote and illustrated or co-wrote and illustrated a history of his World War I regiment, uh, which was a Maryland-based uh, regiment that he entitled The Blue and the Gray. Uh, meaning that some 50 years after the Civil War, uh, the author of, of Highlights was, was uh, a part of a military tradition that saw uh, um, itself as having um, uh, both Confederate and Union lineage. And, and that is not uh, totally atypical in Maryland's popular culture as far as I'm aware of it. Uh, I know, for example, Maryland uh, has amateur baseball teams that they enter in tournaments named the Yankee Rebels. Um, uh, to acknowledge both the West uh, and Eastern portions of Maryland's political sympathies during the, uh, during the Civil War. So um, there, there seems to be a reconciliationist thread that runs through Maryland, the, Re the, the World War I regiment and his highlights of American uh, Civil War series. I would, I would love to get down more granular into the his work and know did the whole civil war series get published say by the atlanta constitution or did some of it get published by the atlanta constitution you know i'd really like to know if um publishing choices were made you know by the content that was covered um another example that i had for you guys where is, there it is, um, is this one here. So this is the one that precedes the, the strip about the Monroe Doctrine. Um, and Maureen asked me to come in and introduce her class 
two highlights and I showed them, we talked about this. Um, and I, you know, I asked them to, to talk about it in the context that this is, you know, this is 1925. So not only what does this tell us about the history of the Holy Alliance and the lead up to the Monroe Doctrine, but what does it tell us about 1925? Um, and, you know, I mean, poor kids, right? Like <laughs> on the spur of the moment, tell me about the 1920s. And, they, you know, they, they, they tried, actually, they, they got some really good stuff. You know, they're like, well, you know, this is, you know, fear of, of communism. And I'm like, okay, so, you know, there's, there's that sort of Russia's the bad guy kind of, you know, red scare sort of stuff is emerging. And I can kind of see that. But it was that last panel in particular that I wanted them to, to, to focus on. And the, the phrase, you know, America for Americans in 1925 had really come to mean something Thing very specific because the KKK was using it and you know building its membership around this idea and of course Mansfield is trying to put it in the context of for the people of the Americas not Europeans um, but it being in 1925 it sort of is also suggestive of of other um, sorts of um, ideas and feelings. If anyone has any interest in any comics, you know, about something that they're interested, like Chris, you know, in the Civil War, or any topic that you're ever covering, just at, you know, let me know, and I'll I'll tell you. There's there's so much stuff, so much stuff. Matt, um, could you go back to that? I'm sorry. Yeah. And show the could you um enlarge the first panel there? Yep. So the first the panel first on the um the this, left. On the left, yes. Come on. There we go. So here. I can't see it. Oh, there you are. Yes. That first. Oh, okay. Before we get um, to the, hold on, hold on one second. I'll do it this way. Oh, I can see it now. So you have oh. <laughs> South. Is it South American insurgents? Does it say? Uh, I think it does. Let me um, here. Let me get to the actual page. Chronicling America. Just a massive shout out to the Library of Congress. <laughs> Because I, I, I find it rather interesting with the last panel, Americans for America for Americans, here mm -hmm. you have the, the, the southern border, if you will. And in the second panel, you have these rather, you have the, the rather the, the Kaiser-like um, mm -hmm. German figure and German militarism and the, and the czarist, and I take the Holy Land, Austria, on mm -hmm. here or Italy. Um, and then you have the, the Russian, the, I think this is very interesting and in, uh, we, how, we, how you can relate it to today as well. Yeah. And, and why, why the- Absolutely. And why 1925, excuse me. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, no problem. Um, while I'm here, I, um, Let's see, hold on. Um, tracing, yeah, this one. Adam, I did, I did think of you, um, uh, you know, and our, my archaeology colleagues when I saw this one. So it's sort of, you know, tracing Earth's first inhabitants. This is early days for archaeology, right? Um, here we have an attempt at stratification and, and talking about um, how do we how do we dig into um, human history and stuff? So uh, quite literally, it's interesting, particularly the outline of science series, you know, an attempt at sort of early Big Bang theory. Um, you know, I mean, we don't even have we don't even have plate tectonics yet. 
<laughs> you know, um, we don't we don't know what's causing earthquakes in the 1920s. Um, and and so it's sort of interesting how you get some of that discussion in these series. Uh, thanks, great. Marianne. It's it's, yeah. a, it's a great talk, and and uh, it's so great that it can link to you know active classes that are ongoing, and help students connect with this material. Um, so I appreciate you presenting this week, and uh, thank and you thanks, guys. Thanks for all the attendees. We'll have Chris uh, next month. Um, we had a good segue there as he was talking about the reconstruction. We'll have some reconstruction talk uh, next uh, month. So thanks everybody for attending. Thanks, Marianne, for the talk and, and for the also the assist on the class uh, as well. It's it's just very cool to have. Uh, uh, appreciate you sharing uh, your stuff. Make every class better. Happy to do it. Happy to do it. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, everybody.